The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning and welcome, Southside Bible Church. We're grateful for any visitors who have come here to worship with us this morning. Uh, one thing is we're, we're a family. We've been bought by the blood of Christ, and we have a bond that's closer than, than blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, and uh, we want to welcome Seth into the family, brother. Yeah. Only conversion could put you in a suit, brother. I love it. I love it. That's beautiful. Well, this is Easter Sunday, it's a very special morning where we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the most significant event in the history of this world. And so my goal this morning is to help you understand why is that the most significant event in history and of your life. I'm going to shoot to open that up. And I'm just going to tell you right out of the gate, my methodology is I'm not uh, running for political office. Um, I, I'm not going to try to persuade you with my thoughts. I'm not going to, you know, I just, I want you to even challenge your own thoughts. And I want to bring you today to what does God say? What does God's word say about the significance that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead? And so I come as an ambassador. I represent Jesus Christ. And so I come before you. The word of God says that he is going to beg and entreat you through this servant this morning. God himself, through his truth, is going to be begging you to hear this and to respond rightly to this great reality. And so we come this morning, I'm going to ask you to pray. I usually, if you're visiting, I usually preach on like half a verse for 50 minutes. And he just read 46 verses. So I want you to text your relatives and tell them you're going to be a little bit late. Okay? And so we're going to ask for a special grace that Pastor Murphy can actually get through these verses. I'm shooting for a half hour. Okay? So let's go before God and ask him to do something special. Father, we come before you and that veil has been torn in two. We have full access to the living God. And I thank you that Jesus was raised, to, that we are now justified. We're declared not guilty before our God. We have full access to you, O oh God. And I pray this morning now that your spirit would move through these words and that everyone in this place would know these are the words of God and that your spirit would come now and apply them in power. God, let us see the realities of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to look at uh, John chapter 11. John was called the beloved apostle. He was always laying at the bosom of Jesus. He was in the intimate three that would draw near to him. And so this is his account of the gospel. And I want to give you kind of a, a brief uh, overview of the gospel of John and I'm going to tell you at the, at the end, there's really like two volumes that we're going to look at in John. Is chapters 1 through 12 are the book of Jesus' signs. And they're, they're showing you, they're there to, to tell you uh, why he's writing this book. He said, I write this at the end is so that you would hear and see and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So 12 that we're going to see, the first 12 chapters are seven miracles showing that what, only what God could do. They're authenticating that this one called Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the Son of God. And then in the next chapters, 13 through 21, he's going to unfold and reveal his glory, his passion to the cross, and his resurrection, and to bring about a salvation as the Savior of the world. In chapter 1, John introduces his book, and he calls Jesus the light of the world. And he's come into our darkness, and he shines, and he shows the truth of God, and why you've been created, and what this is all about. And it says the darkness didn't like the light, and it tried to put it out. Thus far in the gospel, Jesus has been shining. And he's been showing signs of who he is and his power, and he's preaching his kingdom. And he's shown, shown seven signs in this first section. He turned water into wine as his first one. And then he's moved, and he's been healing and doing miraculous things. And now we're going to come to his seventh sign, and he's going to raise a dead man uh, named Lazarus. And so what is happening now is the darkness is trying to extinguish the light. In the first 10 chapters, six times, it said the darkness tried to put the light out. They tried to stone him. They tried to kill him. 
And at the end of this chapter, if you'll just flip forward to John 11, look at verse 53. After the raising of Lazarus, from that day on, they, the Pharisees, planned together to kill him. His light has been so bright now in raising the dead. We got to kill him. We got to bow to him and surrender, or we got to kill him. And so from that point on, we're going to get rid of this light. We got to remove him from this earth. And so as we come to chapter 11, Jesus will now do his most glorious miracle to date. And as we look at this chapter together, I'm going to give you an outline so that we can kind of hang it on it and journey together through these verses this morning. We're going to look at Jesus' unexpected delay. We're going to look at his personal ministry. It's going to reveal his deep emotions. And then we're going to look at his resurrection power as we close out this morning. So let's begin with Jesus' unexpected delay. <coughs> Jesus hears that his friend Lazarus is sick. His sisters are Martha and Mary. And we're told he's in very critical condition. There's a real possibility of him dying. And Jesus is about a two to three day journey away from where Lazarus is near Jerusalem and Bethany. And therefore the sisters dispatch a message to Jesus. And so he would be aware. They wanted him to know that they're in a crisis and Lazarus is in danger. And the message said, if you look in verse three, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And Jesus responds to his apostles in verse 4. When he heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. He's not going to die. There's going to there's be a way that God is going to be glorified through these circumstances and events. And then in verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And this is what I call this unexpected delay. We're told that Jesus loved him several times in this text. And now we're told the one who you love is really sick, potentially unto death. And Jesus doesn't rush off immediately to go help him. What would you do if someone you loved was sick? I want to get over there. I want to help. But he stays two more days and it appears for no reason at all. Why? How do you reconcile? It says Jesus loves them, therefore he delays two days. Well, the answer is verse 4. Because the glory of God is going to be put on display by the delay of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to hear this this morning. The love of God, it's not health, wealth, and prosperity. Jesus didn't come to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Get that out of your mind. He came, he said, the measure of his love is by how much of himself he reveals to you. The love of Christ is revealing himself to you in all of his fullness. To reveal himself to us is the greatest love that God could ever give. It's greater than doing everything according to our thoughts and our timelines and how we think everything should work out. There's something greater. And it's God revealing and disclosing himself to us. And so the love of Jesus is what he's going to disclose to this family that he loved and to everyone who will ever read this account. And I've been praying that he would disclose his love to you this morning in the same way that he did to this family. It's so sweet, even unto death. Jesus delays to display his greater glory in ways that he would not have if he did not delay. And there's times that he will delay and he'll reveal more of his glory to us as his followers. So in our context, he stays two more days, and then it's a two-day journey to get to Jerusalem. And I learned something interesting this week. A uh, rabbinic teaching of the day was when someone died, they taught that the spirit of the person would hover over the body for three more days. And if the body resuscitated, the spirit would then return to them. But four days, all hope of recitation is gone, and, and you're pronounced dead. And so in that day and age, four days was done. There's no hope. And so Jesus does not rush. The onlookers would never be able to just say, Lazarus got some sleep and he healed and he, and he came back. He's dead. Lazarus is dead. In verse 7, Jesus says, Then after this, he said to his disciples, Then let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you 
Are we going to go there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, uh, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And this he said in verse 11, after he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of the sleep. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, that's good. He's going to recover. He might heal. In verse 13, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there (laughs) so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And therefore Thomas, who's called Didymus, doubting Thomas, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we might die with him. Okay, if he's going to go back to there, they were just trying to kill him, let's go back and just die with Jesus. That's Jesus' unexpected delay. And secondly, what I want to look at then is I want to see Jesus' personal ministry in verses 17 through 27. Let's look at verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. And now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I don't know if that's unbelief or great faith. You know, if you'd have been here like she's grumbling or she's just stating this beautiful fact, if you were here, he would not have died. But even now in verse 22, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And so just this amazing interaction with Martha. If if you were here, he wouldn't have died. You're Jesus. Jesus. In verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And so Martha is now sharing her theology. She's sharing her belief, her creed, so to speak, that there's going to be a final day of resurrection where every soul is going to be resurrected and stand before this Christ. And you're going to be resurrected unto eternal life or unto eternal death. And so there will be a resurrection of every life, and Martha is is getting it. And I grew up saying a creed every Sunday. I stood in a church and and said that we believe that there's going to be a resurrection at the end, and we declared it every Sunday while I was just clueless of what I was declaring. And Martha says, I know on the last day, Jesus, there will be a great resurrection. And I believe that Lazarus will rise. I believe that you've taught us that, you've told us that. He's going to rise on the last day. Great theology. <clears throat> but something amazing is about to happen in our text and why I chose it this morning. Jesus says something that should have brought everyone to their knees. Everyone should have fallen on their faces at that place. All the mourners, everyone right then should have just went down to worship. And listen to what he says in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Jesus is not speaking about Lazarus being raised on the last day. It's not the time when all who have died in Christ will be raised unto resurrection life. He's not quoting a creed to her. And I want you to hear this this morning. Jesus is not just a theology. So many people today in the church stop where Martha did. And we're going to stop at just a a cold orthodoxy. A creed that we repeat every Sunday. And we'll walk in and say, he's risen indeed. And we'll repeat all these things and we're going to stop short of what Jesus is going to be offering to Martha this morning and what he's offering to all of us. And Jesus says, ego eimi, I am. And when God revealed himself to Moses, when he's going to lead out the people, he says, who, who, who are you? And he reveals this, I'm this present, always, always existing, eternal God, I am. And now Jesus stands in the midst of them all and says, I am. I'm God. And I'm the creed. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the one who has all authority 
over life and death. I speak and worlds and universes are brought into existence. <laughs> On the last day, I will just speak and everyone, all the dead from all of history will rise to a life of eternal suffering or eternal life with me. I'm the one. I'm the sovereign one over resurrection. And I laid on my life later, and he says, I have the authority to lay it down, I have the authority to raise it up again. I have all authority over life and death. You don't. <laughs> Jesus does. And he declares when we die and when we rise, he's the sovereign one over life and death. Oh, this one Martha is the one who stands in your midst. He's not a theology. Guys, he's not a creed. He's the living one. He's the eternal I am who's the resurrection and the life. And he's saying, don't divide me from a theology or a belief. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. You'll never be more alive if you're in this resurrected one than when you die, he'll give you life. In verse 26, he says, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Nothing will ever be able to separate you, believer, from the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, not even death. Death cannot separate. Where, oh, death is your victory. And he's saying nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, not life or death. He's sovereign over it. Death can't separate you from this one with all authority. Amen? Martha, do you believe this? There is such a difference between knowing a creed, knowing some truth, versus knowing the power of the one who is truth. And that's what Jesus is bringing this morning. So many people this morning are going to proclaim the creed, and they believe that they will rise on the last day to resurrection. But there's a big difference in what Jesus is calling for in this passage and in our hearts. And so he's looking at you, saying, do you believe this? Jesus is driving it to a head. Kind of ruins the ham today, doesn't it? Just a little bit. He's driving it to himself. He's driving Martha to find eternal life in him, not a theology. <laughs> I want you to have me, him, the one who came to give life to all who would re receive him. I, I'm offering myself. Come. Jesus is the creed. He's the power of the resurrection. This is who is standing in your midst. Martha, get it. I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe, you're about to get a little trailer of what's coming, Martha. To what's going to come at the end of the age. I'm going to give you a little glimpse right now on earth. And what you're about to see with Lazarus he says, I'm going to call him forth from the dead and he's going to come forth. That's what's going to happen on the last day to every soul. When I call to all the dead and say, come forth, they all will come forth. And you're going to get a little trailer right here with Lazarus of what your last day is coming. Jesus speaks, come forth, and every soul will be brought back to a resurrection life and, and judgment before this God. Martha, I'm what you need. <laughs> I'm what you need. Not just Lazarus, back to life. You need the resurrection and the life, and I'm here. And I've come to give life. John says at the end of his gospel in chapter 20, verse 31, I write these things so that you will believe. And the whole gospel of John was written to bring you to the place that he just brought Martha. And he's bringing you to this place is, do you believe? And look at her testimony. I think one of the best testimonies in all of the Bible in verse 27 of belief. She said to Jesus, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. You're what God has promised for thousands of years that he would bring in this world to bring men back to God. He's the one who would come and undo the works of the devil and bring us back into a relationship with the living God that we lost in the garden. I, I believe you're that Christ. And you're the Son of God. You're God himself incarnate standing here in our midst. And you're even he who comes 
into the world, that God has come into this world on a mission to seek and to save that which was lost. I believe you're that one. Jesus drove Martha right into his arms. <laughs> so beautiful. And so I want you to see there was an unexpected delay to show the glory of God. I want you to see Jesus' personal ministry of where he, he drives uh, Martha to this point of faith in who he is. And now I want to look at this third point of Jesus' deep emotions that catch you a little bit off guard. And I'm going to read in verse 28. <clears throat> when she said this, she went away and she called Mary her sister, saying secretly, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. And now Jesus had not yet come in the village and was still in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to go to the tomb and just weep there and grieve. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, uh, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Almost the same thing Martha said, huh? When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the one who had sit at his feet and learn, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, it says he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And, all, and here we, is the difference between just believing a creed and salvation. See, a creed has no emotions. A creed is a body of truth. And I just meet too many people that that's all Christianity is, is just an external creed. It's dead and there's just no life. And this is Jesus now. We're going to come and see he's more than a creed. He's the living one. A creed has no emotions, just a body of truth with facts put together. But this is a person that we come to, and he is a sympathetic Savior. There's a heart to your God. He has emotions. He's human. He took on flesh. He's a living Savior, and he's inviting you into a living relationship with him. It's not dead. It's not cold orthodoxy. It's a vital, living relationship with Jesus Christ. Get that. In verse 3, it says, He whom you love is sick. In verse 5, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. In verse 11, our friend Lazarus. And then in verse 33, it says he's deeply moved. And that Greek word means a, a breaking up of the emotions. It actually referred to being stirred up in anger. And he was troubled, which means shaking or shuddering or irritated. There, there, there's, there's something that has stirred and provoked the Lord Jesus Christ greatly. There's even an anger that has been stirred up. And then in verse 35, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. <laughs> Why? He delayed two days. He knew what he was going to do. He knew the glory that's about to break forth. God's glory is about to be displays, displayed in amazing power. So why? Well, Jesus is looking right here at what sin has produced. It's brought death. It's brought people to be doubting and blaming God when he's about to show his glory. There's mourning. All of this. I just want you to hear this. We have a Savior who cares. He hates sin. And what it's done and what it's doing to your lives. There's a grieving here. There's wept. There's a sympathetic high priest. And I want you to hear that. He, he cares if you're sitting here and you're going through a divorce or you've lost a loved one or just the pressures of work and finance. What, I just want you to hear this. This isn't a cold creed. It's a living God. He feels for you. In fact, he's here to deal with it once and for all. He hates death. And he's going to enter into it in just a few short days. And he's going to go up on a cross. And our sins are going to be put upon him on a cross. And God's not going to spare his own son. He pulls out his sword of justice. And he's going to pierce his own son right there on this cross for our transgressions. He gives him justice so he can give us mercy for our sins. But Jesus is going to go break the power of death. He's going to snap its jaws. And he's going to just defeat it and be raised. And so all who are joined to him are going to follow in resurrection life. He's going to defeat it. Hebrews says he's going to render inoperative the one who had the power over death. 
<laughs> he's lost his, his jaws, the teeth, they're gone. For the believer, there's no more sting and death because Christ took that sting. So I cry to you guys, he cares. You can't find anyone in this world who cares, can you? It's hard. And here's this sympathetic high priest who cares and weps. He cares about your lost loved ones and what sin is doing in your life this morning. He cares that you're dying one day at a time. And he cares that you're going to end up in a grave, no matter how many vitamins you take. <laughs> the sympathy of the one who's fully God and fully man we can never fully grasp. He is a sympathetic high priest. He's not a detached deity, and he's not a disinterested God. He's a personal Christ who takes guys who are 30 years old and lose lungs and gangs and walks into a church and says, I was going to leave unless I was loved, and you guys did it. <laughs> but he takes lives, and he makes them new, and he cares about every individual life here. I want you to make sure you don't miss that. And now, I'm, why I chose this passage, fourth point. Jesus' resurrection power. How do I know that Jesus can do this for me? I want you to look at verse 38. <clears throat> so Jesus again, being deeply moved within, he came to the tomb. And now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. And Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be a stench. I like the way the, the old uh, Elizabethan age put it. They say, he stinketh. <laughs> by this time he'll stinketh. For he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so they removed the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they might believe that you sent me. Only God raises dead. And when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I did three funerals this year where we looked at this passage, and as we stood there at the graveside, I knew with absolute certainty that these dead bodies would rise again on the last day when Jesus speaks and calls them forth. At the voice of Jesus, when at the end he calls for a resurrection, he's the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in him will live even if he dies. And so Lazarus is a picture of the one who owns the keys to life, and he calls people from death to life, and, and we, we all we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And think about four days, how much he stunk. Uh, some of you have been dead in your sins 30 or 40 years. <laughs> you stink in the nostrils of God. And there's a God who can raise the dead and give you new life this morning. And that's where we're going to go. And so the same question that was driven to Martha is where we're going to leave off this morning. And so he looks at Martha and just says, do you believe? Guys, this word is so much more than mental assent. If you're sitting here and you've got nothing more than mental assent and a cold creed, you're dead. You stinketh. It's not just stating the creed every Sunday. This is a fork in the road of your life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus just drew a line. And you're at a crossroad, an eternal crossroad. A broad way that leads to death and a narrow way that leads to life. Here he is the resurrection and the life. Which way are you going to take? This is demanding a response. It demands a surrender. You can't look at what Jesus just did and what he just declared and say, I think I'm going to be neutral. He's either a liar or a lunatic. If I told you this this morning, I'm a lunatic. Or he is Lord over life and death. 
and he's drawn a line where we got to decide, what am I going to do with this Christ? And their decision was, we've got to get rid of him. I've got to put out the light. And you might be sitting here going, why did I listen to my uncle and come here this morning? You've got to put the light out and get out and go drink and get away from it. But Jesus is driving it to your heart this morning. What are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with Christ? You can't straddle a fence with Jesus. You just can't. All authority, right here. Give me all, I'm Lord of all or I'm not Lord at all. What are you going to do with the resurrection and the life? Play games? He's calling for your life. You must turn from your own way, your own thinking, your own thoughts, how to get right with God, and turn to this Christ who's the resurrection and the life. Trust yourself to this Christ and believe in him who went and conquered death and he's the way to eternal life. This is a call to commit yourself entirely to Christ. This, this morning, demands a surrender once and for all to entrust all that I am to this sweet, compassionate, saving Christ, to entrust all of my eternity and my death to the resurrection and the life. And so I'm not asking you, is this your theology? And I'm not asking you if you've nodded your head to this. A creed cannot raise you from the dead. Only a living, vital relationship with this Jesus Christ will raise you up on that last day to eternal life. This Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he's a personal God. Inviting you into a personal relationship with the Godhead. As certain as he is now at the right hand of the Father in resurrection life, he will do the exact same for you on your death day. And one last thought, is I want to make sure you don't miss this, is salvation is it's joining you as one, as a vine and a branch to Jesus Christ. And so this resurrection has power to do what it just did in Seth's life. It has power to raise you from the dead. And as Lazarus is new and alive, now you are alive to God. It says in Romans 6, you've died to sin and you're alive to God. And he can make you alive. And what you have now is not a distant God, but one that you're in a, a communion with, a vital union, and it, it has resurrection power. So you have no power. Twelve steps can't change your life. You can't clean yourself up. Yeah, how many times have you made resolutions, I'm going to quit living this way, and you're back at it? There's no power in you. Resolve, moralism, Christianity is not that. Christianity is about being made alive in Jesus Christ, and now there's a power that can begin to change and transform your life. So what I'm calling you to this morning is if you're tired of moral resolve and broken dreams, I want you to come to the resurrection power and let him now begin to change and transform your life. And then when you die, uh, if you believe, you'll live because of this Christ. Amen? Amen? That's what's before us this morning. Isn't that beautiful? I want to drive it to one last head. So don't, don't, don't go to the bathroom. <laughs> Stay. There's a guy named William Gladstone. He was one of Great Britain's foremost leaders in the 19th century. He was a brilliant leader, he was a great statesman, and he was also a very strong Christian. And one day, a young man that he was mentoring came up to him, <coughs> and Gladstone said to the lad, young man, what will you do with your life? And the man said, I'm going to go to Oxford or Cambridge, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to get the best education you can possibly get. And Gladstone said, what then? Well, I'm going to graduate, and I'm going to get a career in law. I want to be an attorney, and I want to serve the people. What then? Well, I'm going to rise to a position in a law firm, and I'm going to run for office, and I'm going to serve this nation as a public official. Well, what then? Well, I'm going to become a prime minister of all of England, and I'm going to serve the interest of the entire nation. Well, what then? Well, I'm going to retire, and I'm going to draft my memoirs, and I'm going to help other young people like you've helped me. What then? Well, I guess I'm going to come to the end of my life and die. 
Well, what then? He said the man was just silent. And Gladstone said, young man, you're a fool. That you've not considered the final what then. Because surely you will die. And whether you accomplish any of these things that you've just shared with me, you have not answered the what then. And at the end of your life, the what then is the most important thing that you will ever answer, young man. Young man, go home. Get on your knees. Read your Bible. See who Christ is. Confess your sins and repent and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Who will determine the what then on the other side? The resurrection and the life. What then? It matters this morning what you do with the what then. I need the resurrection and the life when I die and breathe my last. I, I just, there's so many people running around in this world busying yourself with all the same things this young man was pursuing. And you just keep running and chasing it like a dog chasing its tail and you'll never stop and just sit down on a quiet resurrection morning and say, what then? And you don't get the answer that really matters because you will die. Hebrews 9 says it's been appointed and the man wants to die and then comes judgment. What then? What then? This morning I hold out to you the what then? In the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Well, how do I know this for sure? Well, the one that raised Lazarus from the grave it's much like today. They, they hated him. And they tried to get rid of him because they loved their darkness. And you might want to get this out of your mind as quick as possible. But just in a few days, they're going to come for Jesus and they're going to arrest him. And they're going to do this false mockery of justice. The worst jurisprudence you've ever seen. And he's going to end up with a death sentence for claiming, I am. I'm God. And they would beat him and they're going to mock him, and they're going to nail him up on a cross for all to see in shame. And his glory is going to shine so brightly on that cross as he's redeeming a people unto himself. And on that cross, he's going to die, and he's going to say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He breathed his last, and there he, he died in the place of sinners. And he was buried. And on the third day, some women went to the tomb to embalm and see him. And, the, and as, as Martha or Mary comes, the stone is rolled away and the body's gone. And an angel then tells them, he's risen just as he said. He conquered death. He took sin's penalty and he conquered it. And the one with power over life and death raised himself. It was a trinitary resurrection. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit raised him up. He defeated death. He took away any of its sting for the believer. So that now when we die in our bodies, we'll never be more alive. To be absent from the body, Paul said, is to be present with the Lord. Our death day is our best day. It's our chariot ride to glory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? It's been conquered by the one who was raised from the dead. And that one stands with open arms and he cries this morning from victory. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. You're just weary with trying to clean your life up. You're weary with life. You can't, you can't be good enough. You've run to religion. You've tried everything. And he says, are you tired? Are you weary of it? Come to me and I'll give you life. I'll give you rest for your souls. And so that's the offer. The resurrected one can raise you from the dead even this morning. Come to him, the sympathetic Christ. Come to him that you might live. I'm the sovereign one over death. It must obey my voice. And one day it's going to say, Ken Murphy, come forth. And I'm going to come bursting out of that grave in eternal life and glory raised body and soul to worship and love him for all of eternity the one who's the resurrection and the life and the absolute certainty of it is because Jesus Christ is risen his tomb is empty 
And so I'm going to ask you to proclaim that with me with all of your hearts. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God be the glory for the resurrected one who will give life to these dead bodies. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you as tomb, the only leader that's ever started anything who's not in a tomb. He's been raised. Victory over death. Seated at your right hand now over all. All authority has been given to him. So God, we see a, a Christ who came before the final resurrection. And he came so that he could raise us to eternal life. But he himself knew that by sparing Lazarus, he was going to have to die. His sparing Lazarus would bring his own death, and he would willfully and gladly go up on a cross and appease the wrath of God for our sins. The way we stunketh in the nostrils of God. Oh, he hung in our place, and now he's been appeased, and he's satisfied, and he will forgive all who come to this Christ. He will wash your sins away and make, though they're scarlet, he'll make them as white as snow. He'll separate them as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. Oh God, let everyone in this room call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and be resurrected from dead life to a living life with the living Christ. Oh God, we thank you for the hope that we share together in unity and oneness. God, I thank you even for visitors who have walked in here with faith in Jesus Christ, the, the bond and the kindred that we have. God, we rejoice in it. And I pray now, let us sing our hearts out in glory and happiness and joy now together as one. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.